just wanted to start with um, a stat which I think is, is pretty interesting. So 62% of companies in the FTSE 100 have been replaced since its inception 30 years ago. Now, if you were to ask that question, why? Um, I'm sure a city financier uh, would say that it's down to delistings and, and listings and, and mergers and acquisitions, and in some extreme cases, uh, the liquidation of, of company. Uh, companies, but um, for me that's all just just jargon, really. And actually, the the, the fundamental uh, issue here is is relevance. So, um, in order to survive and indeed grow, um, the successful companies are the ones that manage to stay relevant over the long term. And so, how has nearly two thirds of uh, the original FTSE 100 become irrelevant in the past thirty years? And I think um, if if we if we think about the way that the big businesses has sort of operated over the last uh, however many decades, um, typically the companies that grew to prominence in the uh, mid to late 90s, uh, they were founded in the post-war era. Uh, so they were very hierarchical in their structure. They have layers upon layers of, of management and, and, and process. Um, it's a bit like the military. And very often they operate with a command and control mindset. Now the rise of digital technology and the impact that it's had on traditional business models has meant that there's much greater need for fluidity and far less requirement around the rigidity of those structures. Um, now I'd like to share just a, a quick story of, of, of some work that we did at Tabor uh, with a large financial services brand not based too far from here. Um, it rhymes with trouble and strife, so I'll let you figure that one out for yourselves. Um, but when the brief came through, uh, we thought, fantastic, it's a big brand. Uh, there is a very sensible budget, uh, very nice people to work with. And um, in terms of the actual work, it was right on the sweet spot of what we do. It was a very significant program because it was being led by the board at the top of the organization. Uh, they'd assembled a, a stellar uh, marketing team, really, in terms of their reputation, their, their skills and, and their experiences. Um, and our job was to develop the brand guidelines um, and look at how we could apply them across a range of different media, online and offline, um, across the whole organisation um, and on an international basis uh, as, as well. And um, the output uh, was this document, which is um, quite punchy to say the least. Uh, so you, you can sort of look at it and go, well, 10 out of 10 for thoroughness, um, 1 out of 10 for pragmatism, that's probably being generous. Um, and what's more, about a year on, uh, the same team came back, came back to speak to us and said, well, look, we'd quite like to do uh, an internal review and just understand how well the brand, the new branding has been embedded within the business. And obviously, like any good agency, we went out, we spoke to people, we did our research. And uh, what came back pretty quickly was the fact that despite this large level of investment, the outcome was utterly ineffectual because it just wasn't featuring as playing a role in the day jobs of, uh, of the team in question. Now, I mean, I've been doing what I do for about uh, over 10 years now, and I've probably worked on, I don't know, 100 or so different brand and, and digital projects. And if there's one thing that I've come to learn is that nobody likes a control freak. And I think in the past, marketing's had to be a bit like a control freak because as practitioners, we've always been taught and trained that everything has to be controlled and consistently managed and, and applied very carefully over time. And this sort of leads me to uh, quite an interesting uh, guy called Hans Mondeman. I, I don't expect any of you to have heard of this guy because um, he's Belgian and of course there are many famous Belgians, but um, he's a traffic planner. So quite frankly, why would you have heard of him? Um, but the thing that I like about Hans Mondeman is that he wasn't afraid to, try to challenge conventional thinking. Now, if you think about how as motorists, pedestrians or cyclists we navigate our road networks. Our movements are very carefully and tightly controlled by an array of signals and signs and, and movements and, and, and lights. Um, and we take huge comfort from the order that that creates. Now Hans Modeman argues that all this road furniture actually is less safe because it takes away our ability to think for ourselves. Um, and so uh, if you remove all the, the road furniture, actually we can all coexist quite safely. Now, he's pioneered a, a very interesting design thinking process called Shared Spaces. Now, Shared Spaces is getting some traction across different traffic, traffic management teams around the world, so much so that a, a pilot study 
uh, occurred in the Dutch town of Drachten, where they removed 12 of the 15 items of road furniture from the town centre. And the results were remarkable because in 2003, the accident rate had been 8.4 per year, and it plummeted after the removal of the road furniture uh, to only one accident in each of 2004 and 2005. Now, the shared spaces concept, it's argued, is safer because the driver is required to take responsibility for their own level of risk, as opposed to abdicating that responsibility to the government or other controlling forms of authority. And so if you think about that in today's context uh, of, of how your businesses, how your brands are, are, are trying to navigate the world that we now live in, it's incredibly hard to stand out. And the proliferation of new forms of communication, as Anna was talking about earlier, and it's the rate and the pace of change of technology that's, that's really quite scary. And I'm sure every one of us in the room has got a horror statistic about the level of bombardment, communications bombardment that the consumers reach on a daily basis. And so I'll just chuck a few out there. I'm sure you've probably heard some of them, if not all of them. Google, uh, they did a bit of research. We're hit by over 1,500 forms of advertising and marketing-based communications on a daily basis. Ofcom suggests that we spend more than 50% of our waking lives consuming media in some form. And actually, Twitter did quite an interesting bit of research that says the average person in the UK will unlock the phone screen 110 times a day. So the point is, <coughs> we're always on. And we can't control our brands because fundamentally we can't control our customers. Um, so how is it that uh, we manage to survive, never mind grow? And at table we talk about remarkable brands and, and remarkable brands, as Jackie was saying, are the ones that are noticed, they're talked about and they're shared. And I think these remarkable brands, they, they do three things very, very well. Um, they have a, a clear sense of their purpose, uh, they're very good at innovation uh, and they're very aware of the customer experience and how to optimise that. So the brands that thrive today are the ones that provide clarity of the role that they play in people's lives and they have a far greater awareness of the role that they play in the wider world and of the responsibility to make it a better place by not just uh, looking after their employees uh, and their customers but indeed all aspects of the supply chain and broader stakeholders and uh, I'm sure everyone has probably come across Simon Sinek's uh, talk on, on TED which has obviously spawned a number of books and this concept of, of why and uh, at the heart of, of his, uh, his concept is, is, the, the is the golden circle, as he calls it. And, and for me, this resonates very powerfully because I think every organisation in the world, to some extent, can express what it is that they do. I think a few of them can go on to actually articulate how they go about doing it. And actually, there's a very select few that can meaningfully express why they do what they do. And it's the brands like the Patagonias, the, the Hyatts, uh, the Etsy's that have made a virtue of focusing on why they exist beyond making money. Now I'm not bashing making money because actually we have to make a profit. It's a responsibility to make a profit to secure our freedom and the freedom of our people. Um, but fundamentally it's an outcome and if everyone is too focused on generating profits and making money then it becomes very very hard to actually create meaningful distinction across our brand. So I guess the question is how do we get to why? Uh, and this gentleman here is a guy called Sakachi Toyoda, and he was the, power, the pioneer of a very simple uh, and powerful process that's used to determine the cause and effect relationships um, typically underlying a, a particular problem. Now he's the founder of what's today known as the Toyota Corporation. Uh, he uh, was the father of the Japanese Industrial Revolution, so he's, he's worth listening to. Now what Toyoda would do is he would go into a factory and he would observe a particular manufacturing problem that would take place and he would ask why has that happened and he would keep asking why until he got to the root cause of that problem which was typically around about the fifth why hence it's called the five whys process so if we as marketeers take that very simple technique and we think of why not in the context of manufacturing but in the context of our customer why should our customer choose our business over our competitors then I think we get to quite an interesting place around purpose and the thing about purpose is that it's still relatively nascent and, it, and it's been talked about a lot as well, I, I, I think that. But there's this new term which is purpose with substance and it goes beyond just asking the question or just answering the question why. And it's built around creating a meaningful change in the world, not just a big marketing idea. Um, it has to be operationalized across the whole business. And I think the role that marketing can play is by bringing the business or being a conduit to bring the business along on that 
journey. Now, just out of interest, I mean, how many people have read the Clue Train Manifesto? Nobody. It, it's it's incredible. It's been it's been out forever. Um, I mean, it's 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 a pretty old piece of work, um, but it was way ahead of its time, and um, it's really provided a crystal ball for how successful brands would behave in the future. It's all about creating conversations and driving meaningful engagement and meaningful relationships through uh, the art of, of storytelling. And, and at Tabor, we, we talk a lot about the power of brand storytelling. And at the heart of the story should be a healthy tension. And tension isn't just for the sake of conflict. There's enough conflict going on in the world, for goodness sake. Actually, it's about taking a position on a particular issue that's pertinent to your audiences and <coughs> having a viewpoint. And um, in doing so, you can engage you can educate and you can even entertain. And I think there's one company uh, that has done this uh, superbly well, uh, and they're called Blue Bottle Coffee, uh, taking inspiration from a gentleman called Franz George Kuschitsky. It's a bit of a mouthful, you've got to be careful you say that. Um, he was a 17th century Viennese hero, would you believe it? And he helped save Poland and rescue the city of Vienna from the invading Turkish army at that time. Now, Kuschitsky spent much of his time in the Arabic world, so when the Turks fled, they left these strange bags of supposed camel feet lying around. And uh, in fact, they turned out to be coffee beans. And with the money bestowed upon Koshitsky uh, by the mayor of Vienna, he established um, Central Europe's first ever coffee house, which he called Blue Bottle Coffee. So he fast forward 319 years and a very frustrated uh, clarinet player uh, and, and sort of jobbing orchestra guy um, and self-confessed lunatic, coffee lunatic, um, he'd grown increasingly frustrated at the, uh, the poor quality of, of coffee, commercial coffee establishments and their over-roasted coffee beans. So he made a, a historic vow, which I'm going to read. I will only sell coffee less than 48 hours out the roaster to my guests, so they may enjoy coffee at peak flavour. I will only use the finest, most delicious and responsibly sourced beans. So in honour of Kolschitsky's uh, heroics, um, the Blue Bottle Coffee Company was founded and, and it's grown a phenomenally loyal uh, fan base through a, a large network of, of cafes, a number of espresso carts and uh, the occasional pop-ups, not to mention a huge volume of online sales as well. So much so that earlier this year, Nestle um, made a, a sick, uh, took an investment which was a 68% stake in the company worth the reputed $500 million. So, Secondly, uh, to be remarkable, companies have to innovate, or frankly, they're just going to get beaten by, um, by startups. And I think the question to ask in an age where you can literally have your face imprinted in a cappuccino, this is a real thing, by the way, <laughs> you've got to ask, <laughs> what is innovation, right? And, and we're, we're guilty. We're guilty as hell of doing things that we claim are innovation. So taking the contents of a, of a, a tin and putting it in a carton, or at least we, we designed the packaging around that and claimed that's innovation. It's the same for uh, developing a list of ancillary benefits around a particular financial product. If we're honest with ourselves, they're not real innovation. Um, and actually, real innovation comes from listening and from gathering insights. And um, I think it's a, it's a widely held belief that in order to be interesting, uh, you have to be interested. and, and Research by an Ivy League university that was conducted on Greyhound buses um, confirms this. So a number of students um, accompanied passengers on a long haul uh, trip uh, and they were instructed, in, in, they were in three groups and each group was instructed to listen to their accompanying passenger um, for different lengths of time. So the first group were, were sat down and they said, right, you've got to listen for only 25% of the time. So in other words, do most of the talking. The second group, they had to split talking and listening 50-50. And the third group were told to sit down and they had to listen for the vast majority of the time, 75% of the time, in other words, do a tiny um, amount of, of talking. So when they arrived at the destination, the passengers sat next to the students, they were surveyed on getting off uh, the bus, and they were asked who was the most interesting group of, of students, and by far and away, unanimously, it was the ones that had ironically um, done most of the listening and a very small amount of, of talking. And um, I think it's that ability to listen and, and to become interesting to your customers and that can lead to growth and um, I love this this 
term that's uh, risen out of the, uh, the tech world, product market fit, and it's the degree to which our product satisfies a strong market demand. And it's been identified as the first step to building a successful venture, um, and one which uh, the company uh, will gather insight from early adopters, and it will iterate based on feedback and improve the, uh, the, the quality of the product. Um, so much so that it does two things. It, firstly, it reduces the cost of customer acquisition, but secondly, it increases the lifetime value of a paying customer. And there's one such brand that has absolutely mastered this ability to determine their product market fit, uh, and that's great. Uh, that's Gray's. Uh, Graham Bosch, who is the CEO, interestingly, he doesn't see this as a, a healthy snack box subscription company. He actually sees his business as a data company. Um, they have a proprietary algorithm called Darwin. Um, don't ask me what that stands for, but it, it sounds pretty smart. And it is actually genuinely pretty smart because they're able to customize their snack boxes based on the, prefer uh, based on the preferences subscribers enter onto the site. Uh, what's incredible is that they can get a product, a new product to market within 48 hours. Um, and they've done pretty much in reverse what most companies do. So they've built huge online sales. They've now gone into more mainstream retailing. And indeed, you'll see them um, listed in a number of the multiples. And furthermore, uh, Gray's will donate a portion of their profits to the Gray's School of Pharma, which is charity which is tasked with bringing down uh, global uh, inequality in, in, in wealth. Finally, uh, experience. Uh, and, and remarkable companies need to create ideas that will make a difference to the customer experience. And actually, if you think about the customer journeys within your own respective businesses and just how much they've changed over the last however many years, um, there are so many more points at which your brand now touches your customer. Um, they're online, they're offline, they're in person. Um, at those points, they can be make or break moments. They can be really pretty significant. Um, there's other points uh, where the brands can exert some influence over the customer's decision making. Um, there's other opportunities to capture meaningful customer insight as well. But I think the point is that there are opportunities to really carefully plan these. Um, and there's also opportunities to be quite reactive. And we all know Paddy Power as a, as a shining example of a, of a brand that um, reacts brilliantly and, and you know, quite um, controversially um, to events. But actually, more conventional brands, if you compare them to Paddy Power, um, have got in in the act. And what's more, they've done so in their own appropriate way. And, um, and Waitrose actually, believe it or not, is a, is, is, a, is a really good example of this. So this is their private label range. And um, it, it's really, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful design. It's got this nice illustration device at its heart. And it, and it translates um, very effectively across um, the entire range. And it all makes perfect sense until you get to the brown socks. Now, I don't know about you, but <laughs> what the hell is that? <laughs> and it's pretty much the last thing I think of. And whenever I'm, I'm wanting brown sauce or, uh, or, or, or whatever, whatever I'm going to have with my brown sauce. And it turns out I wasn't alone, actually. Um, there was another guy uh, who thought the same thing, and he was a budding designer by the name of Harry Deverell. Um, the only difference about Harry was he was actually seven years old at the time. And so what Harry did was he wrote to the marketing director at Waitrose, and he said to them, look, your brown sauce is, is rubbish. Um, <laughs> well, the, the sauce and the, the, the packaging's rubbish. I've, I've done a really nice illustration here. I think you should use that. Now, props to the marketing director because he went and did it. He didn't conform to the conventions of his guidelines. He actually saw the opportunity to um, make a bit of a splash and he, and he went for it. And actually the genius of this, as you can imagine, is the fact is it was picked up. So not just by our trade press, but actually by the mainstream media as well. And of course, what happens when that proliferates, it gets shared and it goes round. And the genius of this is that they can bring down the cost of customer acquisition by doing other, getting other people to do their advertising for them. Now, Again, uh, aware of uh, the fact that there's a, a number of financial services professionals in, in the room today. Um, and so I, I wanted to, to give a, a, an example of, of, a, of a brand, um, a US bank actually, that has um, thought extensively about the experience that they delivered to their customers. Now, the Umqua Bank was founded in 1954 in South Oregon. And in 1994, um, a new CEO came aboard, a guy called Ray Davis. And over his tenure, uh, the bank saw ridiculously impressive growth performance at a time of um, intense um, challenge and, and, and competition within their industry. Now, the core purpose behind Umqua Bank is to serve the communities within which they're based. 
and they have a very powerful uh, community focus and at the heart of those communities are their branches or they call them stores and you can see that these sort of beautifully designed, they don't look like a typical bank branch and um, these stores are used as a central meeting hub uh, you've got mums and dads that come in with their, their babies, you've got business people meeting for coffee, you've got uh, a, people coming in off the street and just using the, the general facilities. Now as the business scales, they brought in a CMO and the CMO really couldn't capture the uniqueness of that experience in traditional marketing communications. And so she created this term, handshake marketing, which is based on the principle of paying it forward. And so rather than rely on conventional marketing techniques, what they would do, for example, was the local store manager would go to a local restaurant, they'd say to the restaurant manager, that table there, anyone who comes and sits at that table, they will get their meal paid for by the Oka Bank on condition that you give them this receipt telling them that the meal was taken care of. So mm. how cool is that? Imagine, imagine if that happened to you. What would you do? You'd, you'd tell people, right? And, and you'd, you'd share it. And it wasn't just restaurants, it was coffees. It was the same thing. Staff would go out, they'd say to the barista, can you take care of everyone's coffee in the queue, please? And again, give them the receipt. And actually, they, they would do more. Um, they do more conventional fundraising as well around community initiatives, such as public libraries and, and, and um, uh, raising money for, for kids sports teams. And when it came to trying to grow out of their Oregon base, they wanted to go over to California. And again, they thought, well, we have very low brand awareness and saliency, um, so our advertising is largely going to fall on deaf ears. So they hired an ice cream truck um, and they drove it round the location of where. And they branded it up, obviously, and they, they, they drove it around the location of where the new school was going to be. They played music and they dished out free ice cream. So I guess the point here is for a relatively modest investment on meals, ice creams and, and coffees, they were able to generate a disproportionately high level of awareness, um, reach uh, and, and engagement. So when Ray Davis took over Umqua Bank, they had assets of $140 million and employed 60 people. In 15 years' time, uh, when, he, when he stepped down from the role, Umqua Bank had 180 stores, they employed over 2,500 people and they had a staggering 12 billion US dollars of assets. So uh, to summarise um, very quickly, uh, provide clarity over the role that you play in people's lives, innovate or get beaten up by leaner startups, um, create ideas that make a, a difference to the customer experience. And just to, just to sort of wrap this up, I just wanted to talk about one of uh, Tabor's um, credentials that, that sort of underpins all, all three of these things. So um, this was the brief to, to rebrand the city of Glasgow, which I'm, I'm sure you can imagine was, was um, you know, was, was, it was a huge honour um, bestowed upon us. And, and obviously 2014 was a massive year for the city because we had MTV uh, Music Festival, we had the Radio 1, uh, One Big Weekend, uh, and we had the small matter of the 20th Commonwealth Games, which is the largest event ever held on, on Scottish soil. Now, Glasgow is a very progressive, um, civic leadership uh, forum called the, the Glasgow Economic Leadership um, Forum and, and they recognised that the spotlight was being shone on the city at this time and they wanted to make sure that everything was aligned in terms of their story to the outside world. And they had this chance to make hay while the sun shone. Now as many of us will know branding a city is an innately complex challenge. It isn't <coughs> just like marketing a, a kind of soup or a, or a financial product, which are challenging in their own right, don't get me wrong. Um, but branding a city is, is multi-layered, it's multifaceted. You've got many different people who have many different experiences and think many different things as a result of these different experiences. So how do you wrap that up in one unifying uh, proposition or, or purpose? And at the end of the day, our, our solution, it, it needed to drive capital investment because the previous incarnation was, was Scotland with style, which was successful in its own right. It was more of a retail or a leisure campaign. It wasn't particularly effective for generating inward investment, say a large engineering firm wanting to create 200 jobs just outside the city centre. And also you could argue it was slightly obtuse given the inequality that Glasgow has as a city. So again, like any good agency, we, we poured over reams and reams of research documentation to try and identify the attributes that we could build into this story. But again, back to Simon Sinek, we were getting bogged down in the what, the rational detail. And actually the greatest thing that we did, the most powerful thing that we did, was actually ask the people, why? Why is Glasgow such a great city? Now of course we all know what came back, it was, it was the people, the people in Glasgow. And actually the whole process of doing this was innovative because uh, we designed uh, and built uh, a platform 
uh, that would aggregate all these responses uh, via social media so that we could understand um, people's views. And, and also, People Make Glasgow, I believe, was the world's first crowdsourced brand. Um, we then went on to uh, work with a, an agency to activate it in a vibrant uh, and distinctive identity that was used on a variety of, of different media, some unexpected, some projected onto um, civic landmarks. Uh, but actually, the, the, the key thing for us was the fact that it was owned by the people. Um, and again, it was noticed, it was talked about, and it was shared. Um, so good evidence of, of this happening was when Claire Balding on her highlight show during the game, she did this programme every, every night of the game. So on, on one particular edition of it, she walked in and she said, well, I guess it's true that people do make Glasgow. Alicia Keys said the same thing. And I'm not advocating vandalism, but I think it's quite cool that <laughs> a city graffiti artist would think to... Uh, produce the, uh, the, uh, the city brand there. But perhaps um, one of the greatest uh, endorsements of, of this brand was the, the resolutely and sadly declining um, Scotsman and, and Bill Jameson, who at the time was, was one of the, the top journals. Um, he, um, I'm, I'm sure through gritted teeth, conceded that it was in fact the people um, who made Glasgow. Now, results are important here. Um, I mean, some interesting engagement stats. New brand reached a global audience of 1.25 million via Facebook. It trended on Twitter in the UK. Um, there was some Scott Pulse research done in August um, of 2014. 87% of residents were aware of the brand and 93% of visitors to Glasgow agree with the brand's sentiment. And what's more, it was nice to get a bit of industry uh, recognition as well alongside the Glasgow City Marketing Bureau when we won our joint uh, gold award at the Marketing Society Star Awards. So um, just to conclude, I wanted to share a, a sort of a, a final thought or a, a story. And um, it's really, it's about a pioneering congresswoman, a lady called Claire Booth Luce. Now, she was visiting JFK early on in his presidency and she said to him, a man is known by a sentence. In other words, um, a leader with a clear sense of purpose could be summed up in one line. And at the time JFK was running around like a bit of a madman and he didn't really have that much clarity around what he's doing and for example Abraham Lincoln he was renowned for saving the union and abolishing slavery of course Kennedy went on to put a man on the moon but if you think about this concept it can be quite useful for brands too not just for former presidents so if I can leave you with one thought it would be what is your brand sentence? Thanks. <laughs>